miles around to throw their trash down in to see how deep the hole was and listen for its end. Then one day, that fateful day, they forced Mel off his land. They paid him off and sent him off down under with a plan. They hid Mel's hole. Covered it up so near it could be found, so no one would ever know what's deep down in Mel's ground. Yippee I -E. You're listening to The Paranormal Lawyer on Night Dreams Talk Radio. Good evening, everyone. East and west of the Rockies, north and south of the Pleiades, in every time zone and dimension. This is Michael W. Hall, The Paranormal Lawyer, coming at you like a cosmic tumbleweed blowing in from an undisclosed location deep within the bowels of an abandoned Nike missile site preparing for the stuff before it hits the fan. Join me tonight as we fight the deep state, red pill the sheeples, and search for whatever truth there is out there, or in lieu of that, any cheap facsimile thereof. Let's spend the next couple of hours together as we explore the paranormal, UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and much more. Come with me and we will take a ride. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a fun show tonight on Night Dreams Talk Radio. Uh, I have scoured the universe for the best guests that we can find tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And I uh, am excited that I was able to book them on our show. This is a, uh, a couple, a man and a woman, uh, who have some amazing stories to tell. And I am going to bring them on right now, and we are going to talk with James Clarkson, the UFO detective, and Joanne Clarkson, his wife, who I lovingly call the psychic. And I'm sure she'll correct me on that. But <laughs> are you two guys on the line? Oh, yes. I hope so. We are, yes. Fantastic. Um, thanks for joining me in such short notice here on my uh, show tonight. We've uh, set aside a couple hours so we can get into some of the detailed topics that you folks have been involved with uh, in ufology, in uh, the psychic area, and all sorts of things. First of all, um, James, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background before we get into the idea of how you got the mon moniker, the, the UFO detective, I think that's fantastic. But tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll do the same for Joanne. Well, I guess in a nutshell, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I attended a uh, private school in San Francisco. Eventually, when I got old enough and I kind of reacted to what was going on around me, I did something that I earlier never thought I would do. I enlisted in the U.S. Army because I had always wanted to get involved in law enforcement. I ended up being a plainclothes military police detective at Fort Lewis, Washington, and that was how I ended up in Washington State, where I've been living ever since. And along the way, I ended up working a 20-year career for the Aberdeen, Washington Police Department, 
Uh, I wore a lot of hats, fatal accident team supervisor, detective sergeant, patrol sergeant. I did a whole bunch of things. After a knee injury, I ended up becoming a child abuse detective for two years, 10 more years as a fraud investigator for Washington State. And here I am today. I got to retirement age, and we've successfully relocated. But all along the way, ever since I was a very young man, probably about 13 or 14 years old, I have been utterly fascinated by the subject of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrials. And I've basically looked here and there and taken whatever opportunities have come my way. I ended up meeting some extraordinary people. One of them was June. I wrote a book about her. I was yeah. involved with MUFON for many years up until last year, and I'm now trying to explore in new directions. So that's probably the quickest and best update I can give you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for your service, by the way. Um, there's not too many people that uh, say that very often, so thank you for that. Uh, service not only in the military, but uh, in law enforcement for all those years in various capacities. So um, uh, I believe that's how um, you get your investigative background skills, of course, uh, in the field of ufology. You're bringing a lot of uh, expertise to the field uh, in field work as well. So that's wonderful. Well, it, it kind of cuts both ways, and I'm hoping that we can get into that a bit tonight because one of the biggest issues that I'm facing personally, and I think the entire field is, and maybe even above and beyond ufology, is how do you figure out what you should believe in? Whose facts or description do you accept as truth? And whose do you reject as being false? And how do you make that call? Now that's, you know, that's a pretty deep subject, and we, I think, we could go for quite a while on it. Well, exactly. That's the crux of the matter, isn't it? Um, you know, as a as a detective, a law enforcement officer, that's what you have to discern on a daily basis. Uh, not only to get down to the bottom of the uh, case, but to uh, preserve your own protection as well out there in the field. So, of course, being a, being a lawyer, I've been uh, in law practice for over 30 years. That's exactly what you try to do is figure out who's telling you what story and who's telling you the truth and how to get to the bottom line. So uh, we, we basically have kind of different uh, but similar experiences in that regard there. Well, listen, before we get too far uh, into... Uh, uh, James's story, I would like to get a little intro for Joanne, a real lovely lady, and if you check her out on the internet, you will see how beautiful and gorgeous she is. But not only that, is she, she is talented, she's an author, and uh, I don't know if, it call, if you call yourself an intuitive uh, Joanne or a psychic, um, and we'll get into that. I, I usually... I usually call myself a psychic medium, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about that <clears throat> this evening as well. But to give you some of my background, um, my grandmother was a professional psychic, uh, Esther Erdman Munson. Um, she um, read cord ordinary playing cards, and sometimes she just had intuitions that she would share with people. And uh, her sisters, her two sisters also read cards, and everyone in the family from a very early age, learned to do that. And, in fact, I didn't know that most families didn't sit around on Thanksgiving and Christmas and tell each other's fortunes for, like, the coming year. And um, but, but strangely enough, no one else in the family, no one, none of my cousins, no one, pursued this except me. Partly, I think my, my grandmother's older sister died fairly young, and then the other one uh, never did as much as Grandma either. And my grandma was a very troubled sort of person she would she would intuit things or see things that she couldn't explain and often they were negative so I think I instinctively as I grew up and, and felt like I needed to embrace this I kind of asked the universe uh, 
not to give me visions like that because even if you see something horrible coming, you really are, it's impossible to prevent it and it really doesn't do any good. So what I wanted to really be able to do is to see things that would help people be the very best people they could be. And to also differentiate myself from others in the family, <clears throat> all of whom told cards, when I was about 12 years old, I decided to learn to read palms. And I went to the local library, checked out every book I could find, and they ordered me more, and I just taught myself to read palms. And your palms, everyone's palms kind of tell their tendencies and talents. You can trace their life history and, and kind of extrapolate where they're going. Your non-dominant here, uh, hand is your potential, and your dominant hand is kind of where it's taken you. And I, I like to think sometimes I can help people um, validate talents or uncover talents they didn't know they had or didn't have the courage to pursue. And then when I tell cards, um, we talk about what's going on in their lives. And I usually prefer to do tarot cards because they're so beautiful, although I can tell playing cards as well. Um, I also, uh, my father died when I was a little girl, and my sister had passed, and my grandfather died in a terrible accident, and so I had a lot of experience with death when I was a child, and um, we were an intently Catholic family, and people helped me understand death in a very positive way. I always knew that my father and my sister and my grandpa were somewhere and that they were still accessible to me. So I talked to the dead from when I was a young child, and I never thought that was weird either. So that kind of gave me uh, an advantage, I guess, in doing psychic work, and I've pursued it off and on uh, more intensely over my life at various times. My first husband wasn't as fond of it as Jim is. He wasn't kind of creeped him out, I think. And he let me tell fortunes when it seemed like it was, um, oh, a, I don't know, a, a profitable or a, something that would help us out, but not day to day. He really didn't want to know. And then um, when I had my son, uh, there's a, a line on your palm. Some people just have a single line across their palm. That's very rare. Most people have three or four lines. And um, that's one way you determine whether a child has Down syndrome, for one thing. They usually have just one a single uh, uh, line. It's called a simian line. And when Ben was it born, was. I opened his hand, and um, he had one single line on each palm. And it really freaked me out. The, the pediatrician happened to be in the room at the time, and she saw me look and, you know, um, register concern, and she said, you know, I saw that too, but clearly he's not retarded. And he isn't. He's a lawyer too, Michael. He's <laughs> a real bright guy. And, and I've learned, and, but, but because of that, it, it, it really shook me up, and it kind of undermined my belief in palmistry for a while. And so I didn't tell palms for a few years until... I kind of, as he grew and I looked at his hands, I began to realize that I could still, because you look at the shape of the hands and, and various things besides just the lines, and I, I came to kind of understand why his palms were, were marked that way. So, so anyway, so <clears throat> my life went on, and I actually was a librarian for many years, and I'd always wanted to be a nurse, but when I started out actually on a, a nursing scholarship out of high school, but... I did fine with the coursework, but when I got to the floor, I just couldn't handle it. Everyone, it was too personal. Everybody was my dad or my sister, and I just couldn't do the work. So I ended up majoring in English and becoming then a librarian for many years. And I met James, and we were both uh, in Aberdeen, and that was, of course, a huge blessing. And uh, I really admired his work uh, with UFOs, and he certainly honored my work with the paranormal. And I began uh, doing more of that work, and um, I had an. I, we took care of my mama, who had a, a long uh, in, illness, and after at the moment she passed, actually, I had a very intense experience of seeing um, people come and and get her, get her spirit out of her body, and, and take it. And that was. Um, and I can elaborate on that too, but but for right now, I'll just say that was such an intense experience. Um, then Jim and I went to the Southwest for the first time shortly after that, and um, a voice told me, essentially, and then I saw a billboard that said, Become a Nurse Today. And I told Jim, I'm going to go home and I'm going to quit my job, which I'd had for 20 years, good salary, good pension, all these things. And I said, I'm going to go back to school and be a nurse. And I was almost 50 years old. Uh, but I did that, 
And I did it with the intent of becoming a hospice nurse, which I then got to do. I was greatly honored to be a hospice nurse for many 